brightest day in blackest night no topic shall escape my sight let those who uh, don't know what to rhyme ask for subscriptions it's green lantern time this is a uh, drum corps international world championship ring if you know what that means awesome if you don't Never mind. The Green Lantern Corps is probably the most convoluted retcon thing in comics, and I hate it. To be clear, I don't hate the Green Lantern Corps. They're actually probably one of my favorites in DC. After Batman, of course. I hate how much reading I have to do to even understand what the heck is going on with any of this. How many Green Lanterns are there per sector? One? Two? Five? Why are some of them allowed to also join other groups like the Justice League? What are all these other colors? I thought I was done with all this Roy G. Biv stuff when I graduated third grade. Miss Bullock did not prepare me for the emotional spectrum. Now, I'm not going to go into the entire comic book history of the Green Lantern Corps. The first character to call himself Green Lantern debuted back in 1940. I'm a millennial. I don't even know what a record player is. What I am going to lay out for you is the entire history of the Green Lantern Corps in the DC animated universe. That's a fun little name we comic book geeks have come to call the continuity connected DC Comics cartoons of the 1990s, which actually eked into the 2000s just enough for little high school James to be made fun of for watching it. Leave me alone, Ian. You like Gundam Wing. You don't get to talk. There's a lot of weird stuff that went on with the Green Lanterns in this universe. Universe. For instance, first they put Kyle Rayner in the green pajamas and then went, oops, JK, need some diversity in this puppy, and replaced him with Jon Stewart before we could even ask, okay, but how does Batman know who Hawkgirl is? They basically told us that Hal Jordan, perhaps the most popular Green Lantern, didn't become a Green Lantern in this universe. Then they gave him a cameo in a time travel episode that was sort of like, hey, dads, look, it's the one you wanted to see for some reason. Cut us some slack. He's from a different timeline, though, so it's not really real. And then they turned around and said, hey, kids that watched the show when it was on and are now maybe dads yourselves. Hal's actually a Green Lantern now anyway. Deal with it. Have a nice rest of your Saturday, chumps. Throughout the Justice League and Superman cartoons, we got a pretty decent amount of references to or appearances by stuff from Green Lantern lore, whether it was accurate to the source material or not. And while people generally nowadays consider these cartoons versions of Batman or Superman as like the perfect distilled versions, Green Lantern, I mean Green Lantern, I mean Green Lantern, I mean Green Lantern, I mean Green Lantern, kinda got the short end of the stick. But that isn't to say there's not a bunch of stuff we can Inferred. So let's just Philip DeFranco into it. Oh, it's me, Ted Levine, voice of Sinestro, telling you to hit the little thumbs up button on this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss all the other cool stuff these guys are gonna do coming up. Okay, thanks everybody. See you later. This has been the real Ted Levine. The earliest inkling of a Green Lantern reference in the DCAU actually wasn't even on TV. It was back in Superman and Batman magazine, an eight-issue fanzine that ran from 1993 to 1995. This thing existed in a weird sort of alternate realm where the Justice League existed back during the times of Batman the Animated Series. And besides Hal Jordan being on the cover of the first issue, alongside a bunch of other characters we either never saw again, or saw much more defined versions of later in official canon, number five brought in Guy Gardner, a Green Lantern who'd actually rebranded himself as Warrior in the comics at the time. And number seven turned around and was like, lol, actually Kyle Rayner is the Green Lantern of this off-kilter DCAU-ish nightmare world and Hal Jordan is Parallax now, okay, cool. In a very similar way, the comic book series Adventure in the DC Universe mash together mainstream comics continuity and DCAU character designs to form an upsetting chimera of stories that again featured Kyle Rayner as Earth's GL and again took place during the Batman cartoon's time period. Gotta give props to John Delaney though. No, the, the other one. The artist. Yes, yes, good. All the stuff in these books tended to follow what was going on in big boy comics at the time, and was essentially erased from DCAU history the moment any of it happened a different way on the TV. But one more little bit of early Green Lantern goodness happened in one panel from one Batman the Animated Series comic, Batman and Robin Adventures, number 17. In an old abandoned wax museum stood a lonely Hal Jordan statue, alongside a wax depiction of Superman. Now, neither of these work with when this comic would have to take place on the timeline, so essentially, to despite being written by Paul Dini, this issue is just as bogus as those other books. But it did finally give us something in a world that was really very grounded in the DCAU, except for this instance and that one time Batman met Mullet Superman, but we don't talk about that. That's all the stuff that tried to bring Green Lantern mythos into the animated universe. So while we're on the subject of Superman, his animated series was a follow-up to the Batman cartoon. I actually didn't watch the Superman show when it was originally on. I only caught the Batman crossover that they later released as a movie. Those marketing 
geniuses at Warner Brothers really knew how to pander to my embarrassed 1998 mom. Child James also frequented the website batman-superman.com, which was a hellish mix of early days HTML and QuickTime files that tried to auto-download to your computer every time you opened a new page. I actually wound up printing out the entire website and putting all the pages in sheet protectors in a giant overstuffed binder so that my grandma could get all upset when the pages inevitably burst out of it and fell all over her car floor, and she'd have to clean them up again because I was a helpless baby with no motor skills and who are we kidding I still am. The Superman site, of course, had a bio for Green Lantern, who at the time was this Kyle Rayner fella I'd read so much about but never seen. You guys that know me think I grew up at the DCAU, but I actually grew up at this freaking binder and you don't know me at all. Kyle's biography says some interesting stuff like, when he is enlisted by the intergalactic traveler Abin Sur to join the elite guardians of the universe, the Green Lantern, his world changes. I'm gonna give whatever WB intern wrote this the benefit of the doubt and assume they meant well. See, Kyle was introduced as the DCAU's first official Green Lantern in the Superman episode In Brightest Day effectively overriding his questionable appearances in the previous tie-in material. But Bruce Timm and co. strangely gave him Hal Jordan's comic book origin, where he gets his ring from old Abby here, instead of Kyle's own origin that kind of hinged on Hal already existing and becoming a big evil bad guy Hal. There just wasn't enough time to do all that. The creative team just shoved him into Hal's usual story and then paid for their silliness later, which we'll get to. After the Tim boys got this episode out of the way, which also first showed us Sinestro and the Guardians and a big row of random other Green Lanterns, they were kind of free to take it any direction they wanted. And the direction they took was being asked by Warners to not do any of this anymore and instead do a show about Teenage Batman. And oh my god, this company does not know what to do with its comic book properties and it still didn't even 20 years ago. But hey, we got Batman Beyond out of that deal and I wouldn't trade that grungy ass Blade Runner masterpiece for nothing. But with the continuation of this animated universe through the likes of Batman Beyond or the follow-up series Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, we learned a lot more about the Green Lantern Corps and their history in this strange little universe day DC animated. So if we want to go linearly, the history lesson actually starts back at the beginning of time, 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 time. Now on video cassette and DVD from Warner Brothers Family Entertainment. Hi, I just wanted to take a real quick second to thank the newest members of our Patreon family. Am I crouching a lot because you're not pointing up at me really? Luke Mears. Yasmin. Samir Bakta. Joseph Owen Lawn. Are there two H's on here? There's literally no H's. There's an H right there in, in children. H.H. H. David Gallagher. Adi. Anthony Rodriguez. Ethan Dahlstrom. Riderless Nut. Ben McLean. Haxton. Brian Stork, Tron Travolta, pass it on. Mark Thundercrock, and Eric Carrasco. Oh, and also Richard Mon12, uh, he gets his name said every video. We're super appreciative of everyone that helps support us in making these videos. We sincerely could not do it without you. And it means the world to us that there are people out there who see this as something worthwhile and essentially worth like bankrolling. We never know how much we're gonna make in a month off YouTube revenue, and it's often a lot less than we hope for. So knowing that there's a consistent stream of shekels from the badasses that you'll see listed at the end of this video is a godsend. If you would like to become a supporter of the Watchtower database, you can head over to patreon.com slash DCAU Watchtower, where you can get custom artwork, access to patron-only live streams, and the ability to watch our videos sometimes several days in advance. Except for this one. I'm filming this a day before it comes out. But that's all from me. Now back to other me who's talking about Ryan Reynolds. Thank you. A big blue hand holding a spiral of infinite nonsense has represented the birth of the universe, or the Big Bang, in DC Comics ever since it appeared in Green Lantern number 40 from 1965. Comic book historians have debated for years who the hand actually belongs to, but that's not this video. That's another video. A video by our Palaruni comic Drake. You should watch it after this one. We see this event occur in the DCAU in the Justice League Unlimited episode The Once and Future Thing Part 2 Time Warped, where time-traveling supervillain Kronos tries to go back to the beginning of time and rewrite everything Thing, and he's chased by Batman and Green Lantern. John Stewart, not Kyle Rayner. Don't worry, it'll make sense in a couple minutes, I think. But GL makes mention of something interesting here. The Green Lanterns have a legend. No one can see the beginning of time. It's a universal law. Write him a ticket. Top 10 Batman lines. In this 60s Green Lantern comic, there was a dude aptly named 
Krona, who decided he wanted to see what the Big Bang looked like, but this was forbidden. So he did it anyway and saw Cool Hand Luke, and his fellow Guardians of the Galaxy universe banished him for his heinous crime of wanting to know things. But hey, he may or may not have created the multiverse by doing this. So you can thank Krona for stuff like the Justice Lords or Brainiac Attacks or whatever. You probably recognize these blue guys from the Justice League cartoon, particularly the episode where Jon Stewart is sentenced to death for blowing up a planet and they kind of float around like, hey, please don't, we like that guy. The Guardians are the creators and ringleaders, pun intended, of the Green Lantern Corps and reside on the planet Oa. In comic mythos, they come from the planet Maltus, and they're super intelligent little guys and gals who relocated to Oa after the whole hand incident. I say, and gals, because there actually were girl guardians, or Maltusians, who we see at least one of in that Green Lantern-y Superman episode. In the comics, the male and female Maltusians cut ties thousands and thousands of years ago, after squabbling about whether the whole see the beginning of time thing was actually a big deal, or if the boys were just getting their top knots in a bunch. And while the males went to Oa, the females went to a different planet planet Zamoron, where they found a bunch of cool purple crystals. Eventually, they used these crystals to transform into White Claw party girls over the next several hundred years, eventually becoming the Star Sapphires. And you might know this name because of this thigh-high boots babe from the Justice League cartoon, Star Sapphire. Since we do see girl guardians in this earlier episode, it's safe to say that this aspect of Green Lantern lore is just as whack as the rest of the DCAU's lantern nanigans, meaning the Maltusians likely split sometime between Superman the Animated Series and Justice League, if Star Sapphire does indeed come from Zamoron. In them, their comic books, Star Sapphire is typically Carol Ferris, but she's the girlfriend of Hal Jordan, and since Hal Jordan was swapped out for other guy, there's no real way to tell if this is the same person either. No real way, except of course by referring to commentary from the show's producers, where our old pal Bruce Timm says she is Carol Ferris, and even calls her Hal Jordan's boss. Does your brain hurt yet? Mine does, but mine always does. I think it's probably not normal. In this same long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we got the Manhunters, which we see in the DCAU, created by the Guardians. Sort of a first attempt at the Green Lantern Corps. Let's make peacekeeping robots, except we goofed and they don't get when it's okay to kill people, so we'll make them do less interesting things and ooh, they don't like that very much. So they scrapped that idea and started up the Green Lanterns instead. All of this actually works out with what we know from Head Honcho Guardian in their first Justice League appearance. Is he Ganthet? Is this little guy Ganthet? The Manhunters were defeated in the In Blackest Night episode by the Justice League, with help from some kind of asshat members of the GL Corps, who we'll also come back to. In comic bookville, after the formation of the Green Lantern Corps, before the lantern rings were invented, it's surmised that a prototype of sorts was created by the Guardians called Ekron, a powerful craft imbued with green energy, and possessing potentially the most confusing and unknown comic book backstory since that big hand we talked about a second ago. At some point, one of Ekron's eyes was lost. The connection between the Emerald Eye and the GL Corps is never explicitly stated on screen, but it is alluded to in the sneak peek for Justice League versus the Fatal Five. Emerald Empress, their leader, uh, the scariest one, who has the Emerald Eye of Ekron that she wields, which is sort of this weapon of unspeakable power that sort of works in similar ways to a Green Lantern power ring. This will all be important later, trust me. The Green Lantern Corps continued to thrive for thousands of years alongside spacecraft such as G-Class cruisers. They appear once in one episode blown up, but it's there, so. There you go. But oh yes, it's time to talk about Sinestro. You probably know this guy. He was in the live action Ryan Reynolds movie. Everybody saw that, right? Sinestro is traditionally from the planet Korugar and was a Green Lantern for a while before the Guardians took his ring away because he got too power hungry and decided that ruling over his own species was a more effective use of his time. That's not okay in the Green Lantern rulebook. So he was taken down by several lanterns, which we find out in Static Shock included Jon Stewart, and became a spoopy bad guy who uses a yellow power ring, with Jon being on the anti Sinestro. Sinestro Squad, this means all this likely would have taken place in the late 80s or early 90s by Earth time, since we know from John's official biography and quotes from Dwayne McDuffie that he's only been a Green Lantern for about 10 or 15 years by the time of the Justice League cartoon. Yeah, we jump forward uh, quite a bit because the known history of the DCAU Green Lantern Corps from around negative billions of years BC to 1980 something was basically 
there were Green Lanterns. Sinestro's official big overflowing binder biography confirms this origin, more or less, but also says he comes from the faraway universe of Quard. This isn't normally the place he's from, but it's where he got his new yellow ring. Quard is directly tied in with that whole Krona hand business existing in the antimatter universe. Like Oa being in the center of the positive matter universe, Quard is in the center of the antimatter universe. So it's basically the anti-Oa. The anti-monitor, who's the opposite of the monitor, if you're following the pattern, created the Thunderers, who were essentially the Anti-Guardians, and they created the yellow energy stuff. I don't know how Sinestro got it in the DCAU. I don't know if the Anti-Monitor is even part of the DCAU. Don't comment below to tell me he's in Green Lantern, the animated series. I don't know yet if it's DCAU canon because I haven't watched all of it yet, so just leave me alone. But regardless, Sinestro has a yellow ring one way or another. And with a name that basically means bad guy, he's considered the Green Lantern Corps' greatest enemy. The famous DC Comics storyline Sinestro Corps War that kind of turns Sinestro from a literally mustache-twirling, snidely, whiplash, cornball railroad robber into a formidable badass holy <laughs> they used the sound effect from the Simpsons movie, didn't come out until a few years after Justice League Unlimited ended, though. So he spent the whole DCAU being just kind of a laughable opponent who just wants gold and notoriety and actually did rob a train once. Green Lantern Kat Matui is also from Korugar, so it's very likely she became Sinestro's replacement back in the day, just like in the comics. Yes, the 80s were back in the day. You're old. Katma is one of the Green Lantern Corps' trainers, taking on new recruits like that Rainer kid, or even Jon Stewart initially, and teaching them how to use their rings with subtlety and poise, rather than, as she describes, like jackhammers. Though we only hear about it, Katma and Jon had a seemingly pretty serious several night stand kind of thing going on, to the point where she knows that he used to snore, and to the point where Hawkgirl felt the need to slap his little butt to remind him that thing about to be mine. Jon's got a thing for alien girls, I guess. One man's trash is another man's treasure. But yeah, this is the time Jon Stewart became a Green Lantern. The DCAU's 1985 to 1990, somewhere in there. Prior to this, he was in the US Marine Corps with fellow future Justice Leaguer Rex Mason, AKA Metamorpho. It's not completely clear how or why he got his Green Lantern ring, but maybe Ganthet over here does mention, we chose wisely when we offered you the ring. Which is interesting considering Green Lantern rings are usually passed down from the previous Green Lantern, but we don't know who that is for this sector. It might be Star Kaor, who was the Green Lantern in the comics predating Abin Sur, but there's no way to know until someone asks Bruce Tim and he either says, I don't care, or time doesn't exist, Abin Sur is always in his mid to late 30s. But speaking of Abby, he was also a Green Lantern of Sector 2814, which includes Earth. We don't know how long he was one before John came along, but we do know he continued his lanternial duties into the DCAU's late 90s, while John went off world to serve with the Green Lantern Corps Honor Guard. Abin Sur was then, for some reason, in a ship that was attacked by Sinestro, and he died soon after crashing on Earth, where his power ring chose Kyle Rayner as his successor. Kyle teamed up with Superman to beat Sinestro, after which they were both transported to Oa and learned of the Green Lantern Corps' existence, presented with holograms of other more obscure alien members of the team, some of which we've already talked about, and some of which we'll see later on in more significant roles in Justice League stuff. The ones that didn't show up again for the sake of inclusion were the grasshopper-looking Green Lantern Zaz of the planet Zaus, and these two reptilian dudes who are potentially uh, Chernus and Zabora? Yeah, let's, let's go with that. I threw a rock at it! It's also during this episode that we see the name Colonel Hal Jordan on the side of a fighter jet, indicating the man does exist in this universe, but missed out on becoming a Green Lantern this time. But more on that later. Sometime between then and the start of Justice League, Kyle Rayner was sent to Oa for training under Kat Matui, and after dealing with an uprising near Rigel 9, Jon Stewart came back to Earth, where he helped form the League via defeating the Imperium and the Martian Killers. That's right. We finally have a name for these guys. I mean, we did like 16 years ago when this guidebook came out and called them that. But we have a name for these guys. That's a good band name too. Imperium and the Martian Killers. Gotta write that one. Damn. It would also theoretically be around this time that the female Guardians settled on Xamaron, and at the very least, a Star Sapphire came to be. Again, this is pure assumption, and I'm happy for a future DCAU movie to prove me wrong, please? While Kyle remained on Oa for a few years, other Green Lanterns that we see during this time included those asshats I mentioned earlier, and Kilowog from the planet Bullivax Vic, who was much less of an asshat. Boom. 
Delicious. Said hats for asses included such linguistic linguini as Arcus Chumak of Tumi Six, Gallius Zed of Noxag, Tomari of Zudar, and Larvox of Sputa. I am so sorry that is the name of your planet. In the comics, Tomari was actually the Green Lantern of the space sector that included Krypton, and he lived with the unending shame of not being able to do anything to stop it from exploding. If that stays true for the DCAU version, then... Ugh, this proximity to Superman would be kind of awkward. Maybe that's why he went ahead and stayed just over here. Oh, and we also get a quick little offhand comment from Kilowog that tells us Jon Stewart once saved him from an alien race called the Thorians prior to this episode. So sometime between when Jon first got the ring and now. And by the season two episode, Hearts and Minds, we see the murder of Gallius Zed and Arcus Chumak at the hands of Despero's flamey purple soldiers. Rest in peace, Dodgeball and Dogman. Jon Stewart remained the primary Green Lantern of the DC animated universe throughout the rest of the Justice League shows, even when we finally did see Kyle again a couple of times, once at Superman's funeral in the episode Hereafter, don't worry, he doesn't actually die, he's Superman, and in the lantern-heavy JLU episode The Return, where he joined John, Katma, and other returning GLs in dope new costumes, alongside the likes of Arija Rab of Graxos 4, Chasselon of Barrio 3, Spol of Seek, Stell of Grenda, Salak of Sligia, Sligia, Halakwa of some planet in Sector 3587, and Hirunan, who was actually created for this episode by DCAU character designer Tommy Tejeda. Oh, and this guy, whoever he is. I literally just noticed he exists. Hell, during the run of Justice League Unlimited is also when we got our first real taste of Hal Jordan. Well, if you don't count the wax statue, which you shouldn't. Because of time stream meddling by Kronos, Jon Stewart was swapped out for Hal Jordan for a few minutes' time. Is this Hal Jordan from an alternate timeline where he became a Green Lantern instead of Jon? Is this Hal Jordan from an alternate timeline where he was in the Justice League and went on this mission instead of John. These and more questions are rifled through in our video all about how Hal works in the DCAU, which I recommend you check out despite YouTube demonetizing it because we use just a few too many seconds of the Curb Your Enthusiasm theme song. Bum, 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 our conclusions in that video revolve around how we do see Hal in the future Legion of Superheroes Museum, which provides us with the knowledge that A, he was a Green Lantern after all, and B, he was a member of the Justice League at some point. While we don't get to find out how long it takes post Justice League vs. the Fatal Five before he gets the passcode to the Watchtower restroom, we do know, or can at least educatedly guess, that he became a Lantern sometime between the return, since Hal was nowhere to be seen when Amazo blew up the Green Lantern planet and then headed for Hal's own home planet, and the definitely canon movie Batman and Harley Quinn, where he appears on the wallpaper of the Super Babes establishment. What's his new origin that doesn't involve Abin Sur? We don't know. Maybe we'll find out in the next DCAU movie that canonizes Prometheus, Captain Marvel Jr., and Ambush Bug parenthesis, Erwin Schwab close parenthesis. Set after JLU, the Fatal Five movie introduced us to Jessica Cruz. Jessica was part of the comic book continuity that spun out of two or three universe rebooting events ago, Flashpoint, which jump-started everyone's favorite New 52. Long story short, the crime syndicate's Green Lantern equivalent, Power Ring, that's his name, got murdered by our boy Sinestro, and his ring went to this Jessica Cruz girl. Most of this did not happen in the DCAU as it did in the comics, as far as we know. But like we've brought up in other videos, it's quite possible that she still got her original Power Ring from Power Ring, because we know this Justice League did likely encounter the crime syndicate sometime in the few months gap between their headlining cartoons. And then we didn't see the results of that until the Fatal Five movie. She does have a bona fide Green Lantern ring here, so either it was replaced like in the comics too, or she got only that in some other way that we don't know about. Yet? Yet? Eric Carrasco? During this time, Jon Stewart was also said to be off fighting Dominators on Ran, a task that seems to be wrapped up in some sort of Ran-Thanagar war. Most of the Green Fascist Corps are currently fighting some obscure war on Ran. That also involved Hawkgirl and Jon Jones. Who knows, though, if during this time he's still a Green Lantern, or if there's only supposed to be one. By the way, we keep saying supposed that way in our videos, because Phil Amari uses the same inflection every time he says it as Green Lantern. Am I supposed to be impressed? We're supposed 
supposed to be conducting an investigation. We're supposed to be together. This isn't supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be fun. In this movie, Kilowog and Salak get a bit more screen time as well, including the introduction of the best new compound word in comic book movie history. Fart nuggets. And as discussed in detail in our Will It Cannon episode on the film, Kilowog is presented in his character design from Green Lantern the Animated Series. He really likes to shift looks. Is that just a thing that Bolivaxians can do? Bolivax physiology is very similar to my own. It all makes sense now. Kilowog can shape change. Way to choose Big Pig every time, buddy. Oh, and Chasalon and Arcus Chumak are bow. Wait a second. That is Barir Watt, not Arcus Chumak. Thank you, Eric. Very cool. P.S. We're actually putting up our interview with him later this month, like for realsies, and our interview with the director, Sam Liu. One year anniversary, baby. But if Barir Watt took over Arcus Chumak's sector, who took over Gallius Zed's? These are the questions that keep me up at night. Whoever they are, they're probably wearing the yellow bat suit. The only other Green Lantern-y thing that happens after the JLU cartoon and before Batman Beyond that we know of is that at some point, Guy Gardner also became a Green Lantern and a member of the Justice League. Because why not? Let's just throw them all in there. Bring in Simon Baz and the Teen Lantern, why don't you? What can you tell me about the Teen Lantern? I'll still never fully understand how Hal and Guy can be Green Lanterns post-JLU, pre-BB. But hey, if they can give one dude's origin to another, and they can put girls in the Guardians, and they can change Kilowog's entire face, then who am I to question this? Seriously, who am I? Please, someone help me. After Fatal Five, and also at some point, someone's Green Lantern ring is passed off to eight-year-old monk boy Cairo, who is the Green Lantern of this sector by the time of Batman Beyond. We actually recently did a poll on Twitter to see who you think Cairo got his ring from, so uh, make sure to follow us over there at DCAU Watchtower to uh, join in on stuff like that. Other than that Cairo grew up among the monks of presumably Nanda Parbat, not much is known about his origin aside from the non-canon Earth-12 comics. Oh, it's so nice to be able to say non-canon instead of questionably Canon. And he's probably the most overlooked original character to come out of this universe. Can we give Harley Quinn a break and do a Cairo Warhawk buddy cop movie? That's Maddie's wet dream and I need it to be real. And remember big floaty head dude Ekron? Well, by the 31st century, its lost eye would come into the possession of the Emerald Empress, member of the Legion of Superheroes adversarial group, the Fatal Five. And it pretty much acts like a big Green Lantern ring. You'll find the Emerald Eye of Ekron more than a match for your ring. Even able to absorb the energies from the central power battery on Oa when the Fatal Five time traveled to the early 2000s. Then it rammed into the sun and exploded, and it would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for that meddling star boy. He's still up there, chillin'. Love you, dude. Wait, did Superman just throw a nuke into the sun? As evidenced in both the show and movie, the Green Lanterns are said to be nothing but a legend a thousand years from now. But while Green Lantern adjacent characters like Rond Vidar or Sodom Yat exist in mainstream lore, we have no evidence of this stuff in the DC animated universe. The core is just gone. In addition to all this stuff, we also got the alternate universe of the Justice Guild, including the Green Guardsman, who's based on Alan Scott, that World War II Green Lantern we talked about up top. And we did get a handful of other Green Lantern appearances in the questionably canon, ah, damn it, Justice League Adventures and Justice League Unlimited tie-in comics, like Alan Scott, as well as various other alien ones like Godun, a Cat Matui looking alternate universe GL alongside the brave new Metropolis Superman, an alternate future female Green Lantern, prophesied by the Phantom Stranger, the trio of Rock, Salus, and Buddha, Suzdal, Zibar, Gnort, Gnumen, Boudica, Tomar 2, Creon, and a ton of other pretty impossible to identify peeps we see in JL Adventures number 10 and 13. If you want to take a shot, be my guest, and we'll list them in a pinned comment below. I don't envy you whatsoever. And last, but 100% not least, an honorable mention to our favorite Green Lantern of all. If I were Green Lantern, my costume would be green. Now, now wouldn't it? Oh my god. I think that's it. I guess I could go into how we saw other traditionally Green Lantern villains throughout this universe, like Evil Star or Sonar, the Tattooed Man, Goldface, and the Puppeteer, and Dr. Polaris, and Major Disaster, and Javelin, and the Shark, and none of these guys ever did anything except sit around a table and wait for a gorilla to tell him what to do. And another original character, Blacklight, who appeared in issues 21 to 20 of the Batman Beyond Companion comic. So there. 
I mentioned them. I wish we knew more about the actual history of a lot of these characters. Did Star Sapphire and Hal Jordan have a little romance going on? Did Sinestro go to the antimatter universe to get his ring? Is this Ganthet? Seriously, is this Ganthet? Someone who worked on these shows could please tell me if this is Ganthet or not, that would be fantastic. On top of our normal merch that we sell, I've also just whipped up this DCAU Green Lantern artwork that's pretty sick. I'm biased, but look at it. Don't you want this? I want this. Oh, nice. I already have it. You can get one for yourself at the link in the description. Please hit subscribe and the notification bell to make sure you don't miss other videos like this in the future. We really want to hit 100,000 this year, so please do it even if you're just like 1% considering it. Would you do it for this little baby? Here's a big list of names. They may or may not correlate to the names of the people who donate to our Patreon, which you also may or may not be able to find at the link below. Which is not happy. Go look at all the cool stuff you can or cannot get over there. I'm not even going to tell you what it is because it's so cool you just got to see it for yourself. That is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching. Bye!